I know it looks like, wow, she made a big mistake when she put this photo up in here, but actually I'm gonna be telling a story about why I have these picture of these boxes in, um, in this presentation. My husband, Mike and I have just finished a 10 month long remodeling project on our home uh, during the time we were living out of the house in rentals. And we just moved back home today as our two week anniversary. And uh, contrary to what you see behind me uh, in this presentation, I am not actually uh, sitting in the hills of Sunol Regional Wilderness as my background photo shows, but I'm in my home in San Pablo. And this picture was taken yesterday and our dining room, the bedrooms, the hallway, they all look like this right now. Um, but I wanted to show you this photo. This uh, is a photo of our recently remodeled home. This was taken in the, this magical moment when the house was finished, but before we moved in. Uh, and I just wanted to show this to you because of that grill in the upper right-hand corner. As part of the greening of our home, Mike and I wanted to get our home off of gas and to install appliances and systems that would be powered by electricity. We had our old gas furnace removed and we installed a heat pump for heating and cooling air. And that grill in the upper right is part of our heat pump system. And Mike and I are so pleased that with this new system, the energy needed to heat and cool our home will be offset by the solar panels on our roof. Uh, and as if generating the energy needed to power our house and get a green heating system was not enough, we essentially got an air conditioning system for free because heat pumps work in both directions. They heat and they cool air. Well, we would never had normally had an air conditioning system installed since this function came with our heat pump. We're really looking forward to being cool during future heat waves. So I am mentioning this because our companion event to the Green Home Tour is coming up on June 6th and 13. Our home, Mike's and my home is gonna be featured. We're the first home on the Green Home Tour and I would encourage you, it's virtual, it's free to register if you're interested. We'll be talking about our heat pump and our induction stove. Uh, and I also am talking about this because Mike and I worked with Eco Performance Builders to have our heat pump installed and we were very pleased with their work. So I would like to thank now Eco Performance Builders. They are a home performance and electrification company. Oh, they supported this year's tour uh, as a sponsor. Eco Performance Builders designs and installs projects involving heat pump heating and cooling systems, heat pump water heating, air quality systems, insulation, and the sealing up of homes. Let Eco Performance Builders help you save energy get your home off fossil fuel, improve your indoor water quality, water, indoor air quality, and make you and your family more comfortable. You can contact them at ecoperformancebuilders.com or give them a call at 925-363-4498. So we're going to go on now to uh, Jen Hurley and Dan Gaff who will be uh, talking about gardening for wildlife in the small garden. Before we shift to them, I wanna show you that uh, Jen and Dan do have a small garden. They live in Alameda. Their back garden is just 600 square feet. And here is a before photo of their garden. Uh, here's an after photo. And in this small garden, they have attracted uh, birds, butterflies, and bees. And along the way, they have developed a passion for and a great deal of knowledge about gardening for butterflies. So let's go now and meet native plant garden and butterfly enthusiasts, Dan Gaff and Jennifer Hurley from Alameda. So let me stop sharing so they can come on. And there you are. Hello, how are you? Hey. Hey. Hi, we're great. How are you? Yeah, good, you got all the family lined up here, I see. Yeah, yeah. we have our wildlife yeah, here. <laughs> Okay, well, um, let's uh, see, how did you, how were you drawn to gardening for wildlife and, and you became passionate about gardening for butterflies? How did that happen? You know, Kathy, it was just sort of an accident because we had put in a native plant garden inspired by the tour. And that was when we started to notice that 
you know, these creatures were coming into our garden and we never saw so many butterflies and birds in our garden as we have since we put these native plants in. If you build it, they will come. Um, <laughs> as lots of other presenters have said, um, they just, they love the native plants and, and they come, uh, whether or not you put up a bird seed or things like that, they, it really, they, it draws them to the garden and, uh, and also bees. I've never seen so many bees, um, of th bees I never knew existed. And in particular, they seem to really love the garden. Okay, let me say, uh, viewers, if you have questions um, during Jen and Dan's presentation, type, the, type them into the Q&A, your questions, if you're in uh, Zoom or into the chat, if you are in YouTube, and uh, we'll try to get to them after the presentation. So let's go over to you now. Okay. You're going to share your screen. It's green at the bottom. There you go. Are you seeing my screen? I do. Oh, perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, I am going to close this. Um, so welcome. Um, this is our small garden in Alameda and we did the backyard first. And you've seen, I think the before pictures. Let's see, the before pictures. Um, it was, it was kind of a mess and you're not even seeing the oxalis. Um, in the winter months, this was just an oxalis meadow and there was crabgrass, there was just, um, I don't know, there's just nothing inviting about this garden, but we felt like it had some potential and I wanna plug Todd Gillens here because Todd Gillens did um, give us kind of the original, um, just idea for the garden and he suggested some plants for us. So this is us in progress. And one of the things that we did is we installed the patio. Dan, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, we, we kind of wanted to create a little bit of a, an outdoor kind of living space. And so we excavated down and you can see Jen putting in the weed fabric there and over the weed fabric went uh, several inches of crushed road base and then decomposed granite on top, which you can see me raking in just to kind of create an outdoor patio um, for the area. And that's been nice because the, the DG is, it's not hard like concrete, um, it's pretty stable, but it, it, the water drains through it and it's uh, fairly organic looking. Um, but no, just take note of the bed there, um, the completely bare bed, that's kind of where I'm working. Uh, it's completely filled in now and it's kind of fun to see those before and after pictures. Um, so that was the bed that you saw in the previous picture. And now this is in um, 2016. And you can see the plants are pretty small, but um, they're, they're doing well. I mean, one of the things that we, that really struck us is we had tried other gardening <laughs> um, plans before this and things just didn't grow well. And when we put the native plants in, we were, you know, we were just amazed by how well things grew. And of course that makes sense. I would just add that we decided not to mulch the first year because we wanted to hand weed the oxalis. Um, and uh, sorry, there's a kind of a banner covering the, the good part there, but as you can still see, things are really filled in nicely. And um, as I was saying, we uh, chose not to mulch the first year because we wanted to go out and hand weed the oxalis. Um, but uh, the second year we went ahead and mulched. And then this is uh, um, the garden this year. And it's filled in a lot. Um, so I'm going to focus on some specific plants that we love in the garden and um, how they're bringing wildlife. And so the manzanita, this manzanita, when we bought it, it was just this tiny pot and it is now fully a tree, I would say. And what's amazing about this plant is that it's blooming in January and you can see this is it, this is the plant in bloom. And it's attracting um, the butterflies in January when there's not a lot of nectar. I know Nancy mentioned that in her presentation that the manzanita is also important for birds. But you can see here the red admiral butterfly in the center of the photo. And that butterfly I see all winter long hanging out on the manzanita getting nectar. And here we have the vine maple, and this is a pretty slow growing tree and it's a small tree. And so if you have a small garden, I would say this is an excellent choice. And um, we always had this little, I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but there's a, a red dragonfly and the red dragonfly is always hanging near the vine maple for some reason. 
I would just add that Vine Maple has some nice fall foliage, which you don't technically, you don't, you don't often get a lot of in the Bay Area, but the, it's completely deciduous in our garden and it, it has, you know, a beautiful color in the fall. Um, so here we have the golden currant, and this is just such a beautiful plant. You can see it's got these gorgeous golden flowers, and um, it's, it's great for birds and for butterflies. And I got some information from Calscape on this, and it's the host plant for up to 72 different species of caterpillar. And plus, it's just beautiful. And in the backyard, we have this, uh, the red flower, flowering currant. And I believe Nancy also spoke about this plant as good for birds, but it also hosts up to 85 different species of caterpillar. Um, it's, it blooms quite early. So I feel like this year it might've bloomed in late February and it still has blooms today. And this little guy, um, the Creeping Blue Blossom Lilac. Um, Sandra Navala Lee from Green Thumbworks helped us a little bit with the design of the front yard. And she recommended this plant. And what's nice about it is that a lot of Ceanothus gets really big. And I'm sure you, you know, many of you know that. Um, but this one has stayed very compact. And so it fits really well in a small garden. And it it's, low, it's low lying, um, but it has these really gorgeous, gorgeous blooms. Um, red buckwheat has been a huge success in our garden. And um, my, one of my favorite butterflies is the gray hair streak. It's a very small butterfly, um, just about the size of a dime. And I do see this butterfly hanging out around the red buckwheat. Um, the red buckwheat is nice because it's, it blooms um, towards the latter part of the summer. And actually this year, because we had such warm weather in the fall, we had a second bloom. We cut it back and it bloomed again, I think in October, um, we had a second bloom. Do you want to speak about the woodland wood strawberry? Yeah, so we have strawberry both in the front and back garden as a ground cover, but, you know, coincidentally, it's just such a great um, um, plant for uh, choking out the oxalis. It's, uh, we just planted a handful of these little starts, and of course, over a couple of years, um, they've just completely filled in and on kind of the, the left side of the back garden. Um, and even though we do, we still do a bit of hand weeding of the oxalis, the, 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 the ground cover, the, the um, woodland strawberry has just made a beautiful ground cover. It's green year round. Um, it does produce little flowers and fruits. The, the birds tend to get to the strawberries, although you can't eat them. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it just forms this dense mat that has been just great for um, getting rid of weeds. So for those who are struggling with weeds, you know, you have an area where, you can do some ground cover, this seems to work really well. And this isn't the most fabulous picture of California goldenrod. You can see it in the bottom right-hand corner blooming, but I did really wanna highlight this plant because this is a newer addition to our garden. And I've just been so pleased with how well this plant has done. You know, it's uh, it grows well, but it's not taking over the garden. Um, and it blooms also in that later part of the season. So September, October, you'll still have this blooming. And um, you'll it's an important source of nectar for the blue butterflies, um, the Ackman blue and the gray hair streak. You'll see those butterflies um, on the goldenrod. And we have this canyon gray sagebrush um, in the front yard. And this is uh, a plant that supports quail and other birds. And the smell of it, I wish you could smell this through the screen because this is just such a fragrant plant. Um, it has these just beautiful little tendrils. And just a tip if you are growing this, to prune it regularly, um, it gets really leggy and weird looking if you don't prune it. So, so feel free to prune this plant and it will get a nice mounding habit. 
And so we've been raising butterflies in our garden um, for the past several years. And one of the butterflies that we raise is the Anna Swallowtail. And the Anna Swallowtail loves to nectar on the lilac verbena. Um, I would recommend if you really want a butterfly garden, plant a lot of this plant. Um, I guess that's my one regret about our garden is now it's sort of full <laughs> and um, there isn't really any more room for me to plant more of this. But that this plant, um, particularly if you plant it in large swaths, it will attract butterflies who are nectaring. And what's nice about this as well is that it flowers for months and months and months. It just holds its flowers forever. And which is nice because, I mean, you know, even though we have lots of Douglas iris and they're just beautiful, that you only get the blooms for a few weeks. And then, and then you just have this kind of reedy looking thing sitting there for the rest of the year, um, which is nice, you know, um, for, for the, the foliage texture. But with, with lilac verbena, you just get the flowers all the time. And it's really nice to have that um, color for, so, for such a big part of the year. So um, Dutchman's pipevine um, is the host plant for the pipevine swallowtail. And we are growing it in, a, in our alley. You know, we have this little alley between our house um, and the neighboring house. And what's nice is that it's kind of shady and the Dutchman's pipevine likes part shade. And um, it is deciduous, it dies back in the winter, but it, it roars back. Um, early spring and you can see I took this picture quite recently and um, the I've been releasing these um, Dutchman pipevine swallowtails in our garden. Um, they mated and they laid eggs on the pipevine um, just last week. So we have a whole new generation of caterpillars um, that will raise. And a lot of people have said, well, it's hard to get the butterflies to lay eggs on your Dutchman's pipevine. And that can be true if you don't have a butterfly um, colony already established. So feel free to email me if you want some details on how to get the butterflies to lay eggs on your Dutchman's pipevine. This vine is right outside of our dining room window and you can see um, this huge expanse of pipe vine and you can see the butterflies kind of flitting around it just from our dining room, which is really, um, you know, we have a small house and it's squeezed in close to other houses, but you just get a little bit of nature right outside of your window like that. And it's, it's really nice. And I wanted just to feature some of the blooms that, um, that sometimes people miss on the tour because these blooms, for example, the iris, the Douglas iris, um, it blooms pretty early and you, sometimes by the time the tour rolls around, um, they've already bloomed and died back. But this is just such a winner in the garden and you cannot be just the beauty of, of these irises. And if you like irises, um, the Pacific Coast Hybrid Iris is, an, is another just win, winner in the garden and I want to thank Sandra Navala Lee for suggesting that we put this plant in and suggesting a lovely spot for it right, right in the, the front of our garden um, in the front yard. It's just, it's just, you know, you can see it's just amazing, <laughs> like an yeah. amazing number of blooms. And I would just add to that, you know, uh, Todd Gillens helped us design the backyard and Sandra helped us with the front yard. And in the front yard, we're in the, the east end of Alameda. We're just a couple blocks from the water. And we do have a coastal climate here. And um, Sandra helped us do plant selection specifically for a California coastal climate. Um, kind of uh, referring to some of the speakers uh, earlier um, today who were referring to just gardening for your climate and your region. And, and it, you know, talk about microclimates, um, you know, and even in Alameda, there's a lot of different microclimates. And this, this um, coastal garden concept has really worked well in the front yard. And monkey flowers have always been just winners for us. Um, on the left, you can see the orange monkey flower, which is in our backyard. And then on the right, this is a shot from the front yard. And we just really went with it. We, um, we put a whole bunch of different colors in together. And I think my favorite is the white, the white mon monkey flower. And what's nice is these are blooming most of the year. In the winter, they die back a little bit, 
but they are, um, they're just wonderful bloomers. And now I'm learning that they're, um, from Nancy's presentation, that they're providing nectar for birds. Um, and um, this is the, the front yard. And you can see the poppies are, are really flourishing right now. And if you have any questions or if you're interested in butterfly gardening, please feel free to reach out. You can also just stop by. There's our address. Um, you probably can't see it. It's a bit washed out, but that's our native plants live here sign. If any, if any of you are doing net California native plant gardening, of course, uh, as you may know, you can get that sign from calscape.org. And um, this is the front of our yard. And a lot of times when we're out there working, people walk by um, and they ask us about it. And and uh, some folks from our neighborhood have come to the tour when it was live and they've uh, put in some native plants of their own inspired by our little garden. And so it really feels nice to share it with the neighbors and the community and um, and it looks beautiful. And so it kind of speaks for itself as well. All right, let's leave your slide up there. Someone has just asked, uh, thank you so much before I start the questions. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. That was, that was wonderful. Uh, someone has asked, what are the shrubs in the front of your house? Okay, shrub, let's see. We have, um, well, there is a non-native um, princess flower, which was there when we it's moved there. in and we kind of liked it. Um, but as far as natives go, just to the right of the princess flower is an Enothera elata, the Hooker's Evening Primrose. Um, next to that is a um, mallow. I can't think it's of it. It's a the, mallow. Yeah, yeah, it's a native that, mallow um, with kind Malvia of- Malvia flora. Um, yeah, and then to the right of that behind the bird feeders is a James Roof silk tassel which has yet to produce silk tassels. It grows every year and it's really happy and, and thriving, but it has not produced silk tassels, um, unfortunately. Um, and then to the left of the princess flower, just next to the porch railing is the, um, the uh, golden current that Jen showed you. A little hard to see in this picture, but yeah, there's the, the golden current is right there. Other shrubs that you can't really see, we also have a, co a coffee berry. Um, is it a coffee berry? Yes. Yeah, coffee, coffee berry. berry. It's also a really slow grower, but it's it's doing fine. It's, you know, it's plugging along. Um, and then in the foreground, the ground covers, there's a, a car caramel sour manzanita. Um, in addition to all of the monkey flowers, there's a couple of ceanothus. There's a sea cliff buckwheat. Um, and then there's a number of other buckwheats there in the front. Um, I think that's all the shrubs that I can think of. Okay. There's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. A little hard to tell from this yeah. picture because it, it all kind of blends together. But um, if you're actually in the garden, there's a little stone path that goes behind that mound in the front. And you can see the shrubs a little bit better. Um, it's also nice that you've mounded here because it really gives the fronts a nice uh, visual interest. Like if you hadn't said it was a mound, I wouldn't know it was a mound, but it just looks very lush and full and beautiful. Yeah, it was kind of a happy accident because in order to create room for the sheet mulching, we, we did sheet mulch. And for those unfamiliar, it's essentially just putting a lot of cardboard down, covering it with mulch, and then waiting for nature to do its work where the cardboard blocks out the weeds. And that was very effective. Um, but in order to do that, I had to create some depth in the garden to accommodate all those layers of cardboard and mulch. And so I essentially just excavated a few inches of the front yard dirt and then just piled it up in the mound. And so it it was kind of a necessity to, 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 to had to have put the dirt somewhere, but it ended up working out brilliantly and we put some boulders around it and it did to, to, your, to your point, Kathy, it really made a nice mound and a kind of a visual interest and created a, you can't see it in this picture, but like I said, there's a stone path that goes behind it, um, which is the, obviously makes it nice easy for accessing that, the um, raised bed planter box that's at the right of the photo as well. So you had design help from Sandra Navalny and Lee and Todd Guilens, but you did the work yourself, is that right? Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, and I realized that, you know, a, a DG patio, patio is not exactly a native plant thing, but, um, you know, it, like I said, it, it really helps create some structure and some kind of living space in the backyard, but we, you know, you can't get a dump truck in our driveway, so they had to pour it in, essentially, in the street, and we had to pull that stuff one wheelbarrow at a time back to the yard, and that, that, that includes, um, putting in new soil and compost and mulch and all that stuff. It's a labor of love, but when you put in your own sweat equity, boy, you really appreciate the garden, knowing um, the work that it took. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it was worth it. Hey, Dan, um, actually about your soil, some folks want to know what type of soil you have and if you can talk a little bit about how you irrigate. 
So the soil in Alameda is very sandy, as you might imagine, being an island, and, I, and I, so it's relatively fast draining. It's also really generally pretty easy to work with because it's so sandy. You're not, you're not sort of picking through tons of clay in order to plant things, but we always amend it with or lots of organic compost um, whenever we plant. When, when we've done, like in the backyard, we, we excavated so much dirt, in part because it was just so full of oxalis bulbs. Um, and then we added a bunch of organic um, so, uh, topsoil and, and compost back there. Um, but yeah, whenever we plant a new plant, we always fill the hole with water, let it drain out, and then add a couple scoops of organic compost and then put the plant in there. And at that point, it's just drip irrigation. Um, I sometimes in a really hot summer, I'll go out there with the hose and do some supplemental watering just to give everything a really deep watering. But it's all just a drip system, um, it, which to be honest, can be a little frustrating because we've the garden is never set. It, it, we're always kind of digging up things that didn't work and planting new things and trying out new things. And so when you've got your irrigation all set up and you've got all your drippers everywhere and then you start ripping things out and moving things around, it's a kind of a pain because you have to put a new dripper in and remove an old dripper and stuff. But, but that said, the drip irrigation is pretty effective. What was the other question? Oh, the soil, yeah. Yeah. I do have time for something really quick, just a couple maintenance. Um, uh, the Dutchman's pipeline, do you cut it back or uh, just leave it over the winter? You, you can just leave it. You can just leave it. I mean, I guess you could cut it back if you, um, I don't. It's, it's, it's really it's, deciduous and the leaves and the leaves will, in our garden at least, the leaves completely die back. It's a little ugly because you've got all these dead leaves and I think, uh, um, I was sometime this winter, I went back with the, um, with the hose set on the fan pattern. I just used the kind of the high pressure of the hose to just blow off all the dead leaves. And then it's just basically just the, the bare vines at that point. And then the spring, I'm, we're looking, it's right outside of the window where we're, yeah. where this computer is sitting and it's just lush it's with so green It's right so lush now. and green and it's beautiful. It's yeah. really, really In beautiful and very low maintenance. Be yeah, very low maintenance. And your beautiful strawberries, can you walk on that? I know it's light traffic is what I read, but is that true? So we recently had our house painted. What you're seeing there, that paint job was done in September and inevitably the painters trampled all over the strawberry. And yeah, there were some bare spots for a while, but um, that was in September. We got a good good amount of rain this winter. Well, I wouldn't say good, it was an adequate amount of rain and the strawberries have filled back yeah. in. So I wouldn't say don't make a habit of walking on it all the time, but because it's such a dense mat and it, and it spreads on those little runners, um, that, that root, the little runners go out in all directions and then they root themselves along the way. In our experience, once it's really well established, it will bounce back. Um, but like I said, I wouldn't recommend walking on it all the time. Right. I wonder if you can tell me, I know when we first met, uh, you, your garden was very new and you gave a talk, Dan, on oxalis. You said you just had a sea of oxalis in the backyard. What That's did you right. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I mean, I would go out there with a weed whacker and I would knock it all down and I would fill the green bin, the full-size green bin with just oxalis, um, which it would seem to me like a tremendous amount of biomass, um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was epic. It was, it was horrible. And we tried, I mean, we tried a lot of different things. I, I used to go out every weekend and just weed it. But really, I think that uh, what helped was when we planted this woodland strawberry, it seemed to kind of choke out the oxalis. And then it became more of a maintenance thing. We, yeah. you know, we still have a couple of intense weeding days in the winter or like early spring, late winter, we go out and we just weed the oxalis like crazy yeah. but then throughout the summer I pluck a, I pluck one or two here and there but I really think we've gotten on top of it you know you're always going to have oxalis in well in Alameda and probably parts of Oakland yeah. um, but I think you I, I think that the happy accident was planting the woodland strawberry and yeah. seeing how that really seemed to choke it out. I mean, th there's no like silver bullet. If you're not gonna use chemicals, which of course we don't, there's no silver bullet. You have to put in the work because it really is a pest. And But the combination of reducing the surface area available to it by putting in the DG patio, um, waiting a year before we mulched and getting out there and hand weeding what remained in that first winter. And then, you know, that woodland strawberry, um, creating that dense mat. The combination of those things really seem to help mitigate it in the backyard and then just regular maintenance weeding. In the front yard, like I said, the the um the sheet mulching. And it's pretty freaky like when you do the sheet mulching and then you go 
to cut a hole in the cardboard to plant a plant. <laughs> so many times you cut a hole and then you'd pull the cardboard up and there'd be these white, this mat, this dense mat of white stems of oxalis, like straining to find a way out, out from underneath the cardboard, which there's a kind of a sick pleasure in seeing it die like that. But, um, well, but it, yeah, it's there, <laughs> it's there, but the sheet mulch does work. And it seems to be better to actually not disturb it, like to not lift up the sheet mulch and then try to like weed it because you're kind of um, spreading it by doing that. And it's better if you're kind of suffocating it with the sheet mulching and that seems to work pretty well. Can you suggest we're almost at the end of our time. So <clears throat> what would you suggest that people can do tomorrow if they're not yet you know, on the native plant wagon, they've got their regular gardens. Like, how would you suggest that people get started? Well, I would say if, you, if you're totally brand new and you're interested in it, um, maybe, I don't know, one thing that just pops out of my head is maybe instead of trying to do like a massive ambitious project like we did, find a little area in your garden that, that you want to pep up. Like maybe you've got a little mound or maybe you have a little sunny corner and just go to your one of your friendly local native plant nurseries. Um, and plant a few things and maybe plant a few things that are generally sort of good bang for the buck, like monkey flowers or whatever that you get, where you get the beautiful color. And, um, you know, you don't have to do some ambitious project. When you see a, a garden like ours, which is relatively mature, um, it can seem like a lot of work, but even our garden was just one step at a time. You know, it took us years and years of little projects to get it to look like this. So um, start with a little little spot. Yeah. And, uh, and I think you'll be pleased with how relatively easy it is and, and kind of the, the joys you get out of it. Well, I'm and you, say, go ahead. <laughs> you can't underestimate just the beauty of a California poppy. And one of the things that we've been doing is just sprinkling some California poppy seeds. Um, and then you get these lovely unexpected blooms. You don't know where they're going to come up. Um, and it's a great way to welcome spring. Well, Jen and Dan, your garden was beautiful. I know you've been on the ho on the tour for many years, and it's always been nice to have you and your enthusiasm. Uh, you can see their plant list and photos on the website, and I wanted to ask if you might be willing to stay on afterward on Zoom or YouTube and answer questions that people might have for you. I've seen a number of things coming up. Sure, sure. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for that great Thank presentation. You, Kathy. All Thank right. you. Thanks, Kathy.